Good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome back to the 2017 Pokemon Video Game International Championships here in Indianapolis, Indiana. My name is Evan Latt, and I am thrilled to be behind the desk once more with my good friend, the one, the only, man, myth, and legend, the big kahuna himself, three-time world champion, Ray Rizzo! The big kahuna, they should have had me in Sun and Moon in the game. I thought that was a missed opportunity to have you uh, be with one of those totem Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> totem Met Metagross, we already had Ray's Metagross as one of the uh, yeah. distributed Pokemon at these events. Yeah, if there's someone to boost my confidence, Evan, up here, it's you. All right, well, I am always happy to do it, Ray. And, uh, People who don't need their confidence boosted right now are some of our players who have already made it into Top Cut. We are now on our fifth round of Day 2 Swiss, which means we have already identified some of the players who will be playing in Top Cut. But Round 5 also means that we have players who are now fighting for their tournament life who are one match away from joining them in that Top Cut. Yeah, we always say Top Cut is the do-or-die, win-or-go-home mm -hmm. portion of the tournament, but so is this round for these <laughs> players. They have to win if they have any dreams mm -hmm. and aspirations of becoming the first ever North American international champion. And that's why I am sure we are going to see some explosive fireworks in these matches. These players are going to be giving it their all. I'm really looking forward to it. I am absolutely looking forward to it as well. And our pairing has just come in for round five, hot off of the presses. It is Michael Lanzano continuing his Cinderella run through the tournament. Really needs to win this tournament to qualify he for Worlds. And absolutely he's, does. He's getting there. <laughs> he, one game away from top cut. Yeah, I mean, this is a guy who comes into Nationals with hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of opponents. He needs to win the entire tournament in order to qualify for mm -hmm. the World Championship, and he is so close to qualifying for the top cut. One yeah. more win, and he's in there. He's come so close. So close, but to get to that top cut, he will have to go through Tyler Miller. So Tyler Miller is someone we haven't seen too much on stream uh, throughout the tournament, but coming here at now uh, X and 3, one more win away into top cut. A Cinderella story of his own. Yeah, both players, uh, Tyler himself, he, he got through a lot just to get to this point. He mm -hmm. suffered a couple losses, but was able to bounce back from all of them, as shown by the fact that he's still here. He's ready to fight for his spot in the top cut. And mm -hmm. we'll see if he's able to go up against a veteran, somebody who needs this title yep. in Michael and able to persevere and get to the top cut. Yep, I mean, back when this tournament was the United States Nationals tournament, uh, this was kind of Michael's tournament. You know, this is not the first time he's shown up at this tournament or its predecessor and just said, oh, well, I'll do well enough uh, to at this tournament to qualify for Worlds. Yeah, he's had a number of good runs. He's done very well at regionals. He's won a couple of regional titles. Uh, he's also done very well, like you said, at previous U.S. national tournaments. Mm -hmm. So he's no stranger to this stage. Yeah, and both of these players, of course, if they win this match, will be advancing to our top cut bracket, which will be uh, basically elimination matches from here on out. And uh, either one of these players, you know, they'd be coming in as some of the lower seeds, but you know, once you get to that top cut, everyone's a threat. Yeah, it, the seeding really, it doesn't matter a whole lot. You just want to get in. Mm -hmm. That's that's really what you're fighting for because you have a chance. If you make yep. it in, maybe you come in as the eighth seed or and you have to play the number one seed who maybe went through the entire tournament with just like one loss. But mm -hmm. as soon as you get to that top cut portion, if you have maybe a team advantage, even if you don't, as long as you play well, you know, familiarized yourself with your opponent's play style throughout the best of three, you have just as much of a chance to win, and that's what makes this game so much fun to play, so much fun to watch, and yeah. even more fun to cast. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've been watching some incredible games throughout the course of both yesterday and today. Today seems to have slowed things down quite a bit, seen a number of games going to time or close to it, and uh, <laughs> You know, I'm happy to be here next to you, Ray, because you are the person who has the most insight to offer in some of those long, drawn-out games. Yeah, I still remember that match we saw earlier with Alvin playing such mm -hmm. a long, drawn-out game, going all the way to timer. And, man, there were so many switches, so much mm -hmm. terrain control. We saw the terrain change like four times <laughs> in the span of one turn. We saw some great reads. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the kind of matches I really love to watch. I love seeing the way players can read their opponents, the way they adapt throughout a series. And it's just so much fun to watch all that kind of defensive switch-ins, the way they built their team
team really gets shown off. It Absolutely. just shows in those matches how they built their team to be able to handle so many different situations and position their, their selves on the board in a way that not only can they switch in without losing much HP, they immediately threaten the opponent with a lot of damage. Yeah, and especially in some of those longer games that we've been seeing go to timer, there's a lot to take into account as well when you're setting yourself up for you know a timer ending. You know, you get to the end of the timer and then you get three more turns. And then after that, you have to make sure that you're, you either have a Pokemon advantage or a health advantage just to make sure that you're sort of setting yourself up. It just changes the way you think about how to win. Yeah, it's just such a drastic difference. When you get into that situation, you were likely just in a match that <laughs> lasted so many turns. And yeah. now suddenly you're thrown into a spot where there's three turns. You got to mm -hmm. come out ahead after those three turns. And it's just such a different mentality for these players to suddenly shift from playing that long, drawn out, grindy kind of style mm -hmm. into such a high paced offensive style where they are trying to score a key KO and take the advantage there at the end of the sudden death. Yeah, absolutely. And both of these players, Michael and Tyler, are going to be playing teams that may just end up in uh, similar situations here. And the really interesting teams that we have here, we saw Michael on earlier uh, running these Tapu Koko, Garchomp, uh, Salamence, Porygon 2, Gigalith, and the Metagross. Uh, Metagross are really interesting Pokemon that has really taken the international championships by storm. I was looking at some stats for it, uh, some of the Pokemon that have made it to day two, and you see a lot of the common folk like uh, Arcanine, Tapu Koko at the top. Just sneaking in as one of the most used Pokemon here in Internationals was Metagross. Yeah, sneaking in amongst the usual suspects that you'd expect to see at the top of those kind of statistics. But Metagross, mm -hmm. a Pokemon we really have not seen much of throughout this entire year, finally rising to its yeah. potential. Finally, players figured out how to best fit it onto their team. It's in a spot where it does very well against a lot of common Pokemon. Mm -hmm. Especially and, the Tapu Pokemon. Yes, and I personally just love Metagross, so I'm, <laughs> glad, I'm glad that it's risen in popularity here today. Absolutely, and Tyler is running a, an interesting team as well. The Mudsdale and the Muck, usually we only see one of those Pokemon. Tapu Koko and Arcanine as most players here. And then the Porygon 2 for uh, Trick Room, most likely for that Mudsdale and the Muck. And then the Ninetales, who we saw a good bit of yesterday, uh, but not that many Ninetales actually made it here into Day 2. So I'm going to be interested in seeing how Tyler can pilot that Pokemon. Yeah, and on that team, you mentioned a number of Pokemon that are actually weak to Earthquake. You mentioned mm -hmm. three, I believe. The Muck, the Tapu Koko, the Arcanine. So not having Ninetales on the team is a way to deal with Garchomp. Yeah. Very effective. And from Michael's team, we know he's got the Garchomp. So having Ninetales mm -hmm. as an option against that is very effective. All right, well, looks like we are just about ready to meet our players and hop into game. It is Michael Lanzano versus Tyler Miller. That's Michael on the left-hand side of your screen and Tyler on the right. Both of these players, again, playing for their tournament life. The winner will make it into the top cut. The loser will not come just short of making it into the top cut of one of the top five most prestigious tournaments in uh, the circuit. You know, Worlds being number one, and then all four of the internationals. Yeah, and Michael's been around, so he's used to this kind of pressure build situation. So I'm sure he's brought his A game here. He's looking to advance to the top cut. And as we mentioned, this is a must win for him. If he has mm -hmm. any aspirations to getting to Worlds, it starts here. He's got to win this. Absolutely. Both of these players, you can see the concentration and the intensity of focus on both those players as they enter into team preview. Again, uh, we've seen, these are both really interesting teams because uh, what Michael is running is sort of the new standard that we've been seeing at this tournament uh, with all those Metagross teams. Whereas uh, Tyler is running a, a more, an older version of some of the standards, like the trick, the heavier trick room with both the Muck and the Mudsdale. Yeah, and we've seen Michael's team on stream previously piloted by Conan, mm -hmm. and Conan just showed off just how powerful and versatile <laughs> this team is. And we saw actually Conan went up against a Ninetales. So having that Gigalith, having that Metagross really helps protect Michael's Salamence and Garchomp from the threat of that Ninetales. So it'll be mm -hmm. really interesting to see. However, Tyler has that Mudsdale. Mudsdale does extremely well against the Metagross, the Gigalith, the Tapu Koko, Absolutely. even Garchomp. If, you know, depending on Garchomp's set, if Mudsdale starts getting those stamina boosts. Garchomp isn't going to be able to do that much damage to it, so it'll be really interesting to see what kind of a role Mudsdale plays in this match. Because on, you know, looking from Team Preview, it certainly looks like Mudsdale will be very effective in this match. Yeah, the only real option that Michael has to, you know, take that Mudsdale down is either to 
prevent it from getting Trick Room up, or just trying to cycle Intimidates with that Salamence. Yeah, and he can do a little bit of chip damage. Porygon 2 does get access to Ice Beam, which can do pretty good damage to Mudsdale, but Mudsdale is very bulky, so it will take a couple Ice Beams to actually take it out. All right, well, it is time to get into game. Swiss round five today, 14th round overall. Michael Lanzano versus Tyler Miller. Winner moves on to Top Cut, continues to play today. Loser will go home just short. Looks like the leads will be the Metagross and the uh, Garchomp for Michael alongside the Tapu Koko and the Porygon 2. So Tyler deciding that he would like to have that Porygon 2 up just so he has the option of, you know, maybe Volt switching out with that Tapu Koko and setting up Trick Room and getting a uh, rolling right away. Yeah, and it's nice getting the special attack boost because that should mm -hmm. guarantee the Ice Beam KO onto Garchomp. And Tapu Koko already threatens a lot of damage onto that Metagross. It won't trigger a weakness policy or anything. So I like the spot here for Tyler. I think he can... Depending on if he expects Metagross to protect or not, go for a Volt Switch into that slot, and then an Ice Beam into Garchomp. If you feel like trading Tapu Koko for Garchomp is worth it, then you can go for something like that, because if Metagross protects blocking you from switching out with Volt Switch, mm -hmm. at least you'll lose Tapu Koko, but in exchange, Porygon 2 will be able to knock out Garchomp with an Ice Beam. The question is, does Tyler want to trade Pokemon so early, or does he decide to play a little bit safer? All right, well, looks like Metagross is going to protect on Michael's side, so Michael trying to play a little safe here, and it is going to be the Z-move, the Electrium Z coming out from the Tapu Koko. Uh, Tyler trying to pick up a free KO on that Metagross with the with the Z-move, but with the Protect going to completely block, or not completely, but mostly block that damage. Yeah, so good Protect there from Michael. Metagross won't, it'll take a decent amount of damage, but it won't pick up the KO that it normally mm -hmm. would have. All right, so Metagross does take about 25% of its health there, uh, so would have picked up the KO uh, if uh, Michael had not protected there. Earthquake just coming out from Garchomp, no Z-move in return. Is still uh, more than enough to pick up the KO onto Tapu Koko, though. Uh, so Porygon 2 has the option of either going for a Trick Room here or going for the Ice Beam, opts for the Trick Room. So Tyler now uh, did sacrifice his Tapu Koko, probably tried to get uh, a KO with the sacrifice, or at least some damage, but now gets a free switch into one of his two Trick Room sweepers. Yeah, you have to imagine Mudsdale comes out, and yep, mm -hmm. there it is. Yeah, Mudsdale in for free. Says Michael Lanzano, you want to make it into Top Cut? Nay! <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty uh, good. Uh, that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but Mudsdale is threatening the Metagross here with High Horse Power. Metagross does have massive defense and weakness policy, but High Horse Power is just so strong from a Mudsdale that it should still pick up the knockout. And of course, Porygon threatens the Ice Beam KO onto Garchomp. So still a good spot there for mm -hmm. Tyler, even though he lost Tapu Koko. But it would have been nice to see the Ice Beam take out the Garchomp in exchange. But maybe he felt like he just had to get Trick Room up now for the Mudsdale because uh, it's going to depend. If Michael can switch in and out and just stall this Trick Room out, we'll see. It depends on which two Pokemon he brought in the back. So Metagross will switch out for the Salamence, going to get the Intimidate off onto both the Mudsdale and the Porygon too. Of course, Salamence being part Flying type will not take any damage from a high, high horsepower from that Mudsdale. Michael switches in his own Porygon 2, so that's the final Pokemon that he has in the back. The high horsepower whiffs. The Ice Beam will connect with the Porygon 2, dealing a little bit of damage uh, and not much else. So good switch in there for Michael, is able to position himself so that he can get the Intimidate off onto Mudsdale and potentially has an option of uh, resetting Trick Room here. Yeah, that's why I would have liked to see the Ice Beam onto Garchomp when Tyler had, had the, the chance. chance. He could have taken that one for one and worried about getting Trick Room up later. When you have a Trick Room style of team, it's actually kind of beneficial to go for those trades because your opponent has a lot less room to maneuver. When they still mm -hmm. have four Pokemon, they can make plays like this, where they can switch in and out. Now Salmons can either protect or maybe even switch out to Metagross, predicting an Ice Beam. And now that Mudsdale is intimidated, High Horse Power may not even KO Metagross, which could Activate trigger a weakness, weakness policy. policy. And Michael can just stall out the Trick Room. He can even reverse Trick Room with his own Porygon too if he so chooses. It looks like Michael is going to continue to use his ability to switch Pokemon to try and stall this Trick Room out. Mudsdale does still go for a high horsepower, though, into the Porygon 2, though, not making the prediction there, just trying to get extra damage onto Porygon 2. Michael's own Porygon 2 goes for the Ice Beam onto Mudsdale, which deals some good damage. We'll activate the Stamina uh, to increase Mudsdale's defense, but it looks like that might be about a three-hit KO uh, from Michael's Porygon 2 onto the Mudsdale, which... Uh, you know, the stamina boost isn't helping against those ice beams. Does get toxic for its 
uh, efforts, though. So we'll slowly be losing health here. Yeah, so that's good. Tyler will be able to slowly chip away at that Porygon 2 with the Toxic. Expecting Salamence to not just take an Ice Beam. Expecting it to either protect or switch out to Metagross. Decides mm -hmm. to double target the Porygon 2. Get a little bit of damage with the High Horse Power. And then Toxic put a counter on it so that Porygon 2 either has to go down or switch out. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we'll take a little bit for Porygon 2 to finally go down. Uh, Tyler's going to try and make that happen by switching out Mudsdale for his Muck. So bringing both of his Trick Room Pokemon here, going for the hard Trick Room mode, and forcing Michael to switch out Porygon 2 for Salamence. A good switch in there actually catches the Muck on the switch in with the Intimidate. Uh, so Muck will lose some attack here. Uh, on the switch in. Porygon 2 does go for the Ice Beam, though, targeting the Metagross slot, expecting Metagross to switch out. Deals a little bit of damage with that critical hit and oh. freezes the Metagross. Metagross is frozen solid and is unable to move this turn. That slight chance of getting the freeze on the Ice Beam paying off. Yeah, clearly reading the Salmon switch and just got the wrong slot. Uh, Fortunately for Tyler, he picks up the freeze there on the Metagross, and we've seen some Salamence carry Toxic, so it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see if Michael has Toxic to get that off onto the Porygon 2. That way, both Porygon 2s are toxic Otherwise, Michael may have a tough time dealing with Tyler's Porygon 2, especially yeah. now that Metagross is frozen solid. Yeah, without that Metagross uh, able to you know, use that weaknessy, weakness policy boost, uh, which is what really is needed to have it deal the Im important damage to Porygon 2, uh, it's going to make it a lot more difficult here. There is always a chance that Metagross thaws, but it's completely random, so you never want to actually rely on that. Yeah, and Porygon 2 comes back and clearly wants to recycle the Intimidate. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be another Ice Beam onto Porygon 2. Because of that Toxic, Porygon 2 cannot be, um, cannot be frozen here. Oh. The knockoff is super effective and does not knock off the weakness policy. It just activates the weakness policy. Oh. Metagross thaws out, gets the hammer arm, connects with the Porygon 2. Knockoff not getting the KO, not also getting the KO is the hammer arm, but the speed drop still in Trick Room, thawing out at exactly the right moment. You can't, uh, Trick Room actually ending here, but you can't rely on the thaw, but you always have to play like oh, you will. Oh, that is so huge. Barely hangs on and knockoff the way it works with weakness policy, you still get those increased attack and special attack, and mm -hmm. then Metagross clutch thaw out, gets the hammer, ar hammer arm off onto Porygon 2, yeah. barely doesn't knock it off, but if this Metagross has bullet punch, it will be able to finish off the Porygon 2. Absolutely. Uh, Porygon 2 definitely threatened by a bullet punch. Metagross could also just decide to go for some extra damage onto the Muck, while hopefully hoping that Michael's own Porygon 2 will be able to outspeed and pick up that KO, but really important damage that Michael's able to get off there. That weakness policy boosted hammer arm, without it, there's really no good way to get through that Porygon. That was so big because Porygon 2 was the Pokemon that Michael had such a difficult time, it seemed like, going to be able to get through, but that and now it's all huge because now Michael has the Pokemon in the back capable of winning this match. Mudsdale's mm -hmm. pretty low and uh, doesn't want to go to up against a Salamence, up against a Porygon 2, and then Garchomp in the back able to take out Muck because Tyler did not elect to trade Tapu Koko for the Garchomp. So Garchomp Turn can one. actually come in now and KO Muck. If Garchomp had gone down, it would have been just Salmons and Porygon 2 that was toxic. Mm -hmm. Tyler might have been able to win this game if he decided to trade the Tapu Koko for the Garchomp. But here, it's going to be really tough for him. Yep, Garchomp coming in now for Michael. Mudsdale and Muck out for Tyler. Porygon 2 finally going down, so there will be no way for Tyler to reset Trick Room. His final two Pokemon, his Trick Room sweepers, will have to find a way to sweep out of Trick Room. And that is a lot to ask, especially when this Garchomp matches up so well against both these Pokemon. Yeah, and it's still at full HP, too, mm -hmm. so it's going to be really difficult for the Mudsdale to be able to take out Garchomp if Muck decides to protect. Otherwise, Muck will just go down to Garchomp. It's going to be really difficult for Tyler here to pull this out. Well, there are three games to be played in this set uh, at max. Porygon 2 actually is going to switch out, so Michael's going to get the Intimidates off with no more Pokemon in the back. Tyler can't switch his physical attackers out. He's just going to have to deal with these Intimidate drops uh, on both of his Pokemon, making it even more difficult. Mudsdale going for the Protect, uh, trying to save itself from uh, an Ice Beam or some, any other damage in Garchomp. Actually showing off, going to go for the Swords Dance uh, to make sure that it's dealing as much damage as possible. Knockoff comes through onto that Garchomp, so we will see it hit. No item fell, so that tells you that there is a Z-move on that Garchomp. Yeah, that's uh, pretty big knowledge for Tower there, but 
considering he saw Garchomp go for the Sword Stance, usually that does mean it has the Z move, so he was probably already expecting that. But now Garchomp can just clean up with an Earthquake. All right, Garchomp with the Earthquake. Salamence, of course, well, just going for the uh, ground-type Z move, just trying to finish off one of these Pokemon, uh, and then finishing everything else off with the uh, spread attack. So Garchomp, just going for this Tectonic Rage, will be able to take out one of Tyler's Pokemon. And then Salamence will be able to do the rest. It's going to be Mudsdale. Mudsdale has no stamina boost right now because it switched out, has not taken any damage from that Protect, will faint to that, and now just Muck against the Salamence and the Garchomp. Salamence showing Dragon Pulse uh, will deal a little bit of damage to Muck. Muck has really good special defense, so not that much. Uh, but Tyler able to get some additional information by knocking off Salamence's Roselli Berry. Yeah, so that's good knowledge, although with Tyler's team makeup, that will maybe only matter against the likes of Tapu Koko. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it would have been such a different battle, I think, had the Porygon gone for the Ice Beam into the Garchomp, because when looking at Tyler's team composition, he had Pokemon that are weak to Garchomp. Tapu Koko, he had the Muck in the back. I think mm -hmm. getting that trade, trading Tapu Koko for Garchomp, considering Tyler's team seemed like a very worthwhile trade for him to make. And it just, it allowed Michael to switch out Garchomp, conserve it for later. And we mm -hmm. saw in the end game just how difficult it was for Tyler to take it out and just how much it threatened his remaining Pokemon. The way Michael played that match was perfect. Yep. I would have loved to see Tyler go for the Ice Beam there on the Garchomp though. Really pin down Michael, force him. If he wants to take out the Tapu Koko, he's gonna lose the Garchomp. Yep, absolutely. Going into game two, those are definitely options that both Tyler and Michael will have to think about. Tyler wisely forfeiting that last match, playing through after he was able to knock off both of the items, just trying to scout as much information as he can from Michael. Uh, got some good information, but again, the Roselli Berry probably not going to be too relevant this set. Uh, so it'll all come down to how he uses the information that he gained from that first, from that first game uh, to adapt here in game two. Yeah, it'll also be interesting to see if Tower elects for the Ninetales because we saw the double mm -hmm. dragons. Now, Ninetales is a terrible matchup against Metagross, but against those two dragons, it would have been good. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Michael expects Tower to switch it up and go towards that Ninetales, so maybe decides to bring Gigalith in the matchup, or considering how well he played that last match, maybe just goes for the same four, maybe uh, in a different order, maybe goes for... Garchomp alongside something like Porygon if he doesn't want to give Tyler's Porygon another special attack boost because there is a chance, depending on how Michael's Garchomp is trained, that it can actually take an Ice Beam mm -hmm. if the Porygon is not trained heavily in special attack and if it doesn't get the download boost. All right, well, we're going to see what happens as we hop into game two now. Michael Lanzano has won the first game and is one game away from making it into the top cut on his Cinderella run through this tournament. Tyler Miller down a game now, needs to win both of our games in the best of three if he's going to make it into the top cut as well. And it's going to be the Garchomp and the Tapu Koko leads up against the Porygon 2 and Tapu Koko leads. So double Tapu Koko here, uh, Garchomp out on the field alongside, and then the Porygon 2 on Tyler's side. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see if Porygon 2 gets Yep, attack there's the boost. attack boost. So now Ice Beam, there is a chance that it's not going to KO that Garchomp. You have to imagine Michael trained his Garchomp to be able to take an Ice Beam from Porygon 2, mm -hmm. considering that is the most common Ice Beam user in the format, and Garchomp can be trained to take that. And then Tapu Koko, uh, it'll be interesting to see what kind of set it runs. There's so many things Tapu Koko can do. It can be super offensive with an Electric, electric Z move. It can go for more supportive options. We'll have to see here what it does. All right, well, Tyler's Tapu Koko is going on the offensive with a Dazzling Gleam. Also gets a uh, critical hit onto uh, Michael's own Tapu Koko, which shows the uh, which shows the Sky Drop. Garchomp actually just going for a Sword Stance right away, using the free turn from the Sky Drop uh, to get the Sword Stance off. Looks like another Dazzling Gleam actually isn't going to be enough to pick up the KO on that Garchomp. Yeah, that's huge. Garchomp clearly trained very heavily in Special Defense, able to take another Dazzling mm -hmm. Gleam. It got the Sword Stance off. It still has its Z move. Porygon can't protect or switch out or anything. It's yep. about to take a big Tectonic Rage, you have to imagine. Absolutely. Tapu Koko tries to go for another Dazzling Gleam, mix, misses the airborne Tapu Koko, hits Garchomp, not enough to pick up the KO. That is a three-hit KO, not a two-hit KO. Sky Drop releases Porygon 2, and now Garchomp with that Swords Dance boosted Tectonic Rage is going to be able to get rid of that Porygon 2 before it can do anything in this game. 
Yeah, and I also want to touch on, we saw the Dazzling Gleam critical hit on Michael's Tapu Koko from mm -hmm. turn one, and we saw just how little damage that did that could signal that this Tapu Koko is an Assault Vest. Yeah, absolutely. Always something to keep in mind when going up against a Pokemon like a Tapu Koko that can do just so many things. And look at all of that damage to Porygon, too. Huge threat off the field. Tyler now unable to set up Trick Room, so if he has that Mudsdale and Muck in the back again, they're going to be the slowest things on the field. Yeah, now Garchomp is slower than Tapu Koko, and it is in Dazzling Gleam KO range, so there is that for Michael. But of course, Tapu Koko could always sky drop the opposing Tapu Koko. But now we see Arcanine. That also is extreme speed. Garchomp, probably not going to be around too much longer. Yeah, Garchomp either needs to get off the field and hope for a better position later, or just uh, go down a hero having knocked out that Porygon too. But Tyler showing a, a, an adaptation here, bringing the Arcanine now, trying to get the Intimidates off. Uh, saw how effective Michael's Intimidate shuffles were, and now getting his own off. Yeah, and also saw how important that Metagross was, so having Arcanine as a way to deal with that. Should Michael have Metagross in the back, Arcanine will be very useful at that. Though, Flare Blitz doesn't KO, and we know Weakness Activates Policy weakness will policy. trigger. One of those weird risks of now that everyone's starting to learn how to play against Metagross again. Most things don't one-hit KO it, and if you have a weakness <laughs> policy, you just boost it. Yeah, the, all the damage-dealing moves that are super effective against it are physical, meaning Metagross is usually able to take those attacks. All right, well, it looks like Michael's going to keep Garchomp around a little bit, hoping to bait some uh, extreme speeds or dazzling gleams into the Garchomp. Uh, so no damage taken by the Garchomp. Tapu Koko does take another uh, dazzling gleam, dealing not much damage at all because there was no critical hit this time. Just goes for the Volt Switch into the Arcanine, and now Michael will be able to choose which Pokemon he wants to send back in. It's going to be the Intimidate Shuffle with the Salamence. Yes, it will be. Double Dragons back out on the field, and no Ninetales in sight. Yeah, that's going to be a really nice Intimidate onto the Arcanine. However, Salamence does not like staring down Tapu Koko, but we did see it has Roselli Berry, so we'll be able to take a Dazzling Gleam very well should it have to. Yeah, and it also can take Intimidated Flare Blitzes very well from Arcanine, taking very little damage there and uh, dealing a little bit back to Arcanine in the form of Recoil. Yeah, but it will be interesting to see how Michael deals with this Tapu Koko that's still at full HP on Tyler's side and super effective against both of these two Pokemon. It's faster mm. than them both. It doesn't really have to worry about getting damaged because Garchomp won't be able to get an attack off onto it. Salamence, in general, really doesn't threaten a whole lot of damage onto it. It'll be interesting to see what Michael's plans are for dealing with this Tapu Koko. Yeah, but you know, there's always a chance that Garchomp... There's no sand up. Maybe if Gigalith was in the back, <laughs> <laughs> had Sand Veil. Uh, but it will just be Salamence switching in, uh, switching out for Tapu Koko, taking another Dazzling Gleam. Garchomp will go down here. Arcanine actually just goes for a Will-O-Wisp, which misses Tapu Koko. Uh, so not an ideal target for a Will-O-Wisp, but that Tapu Koko is down low enough that that would have been a, a pretty good amount of chip damage to add to it. Yeah, but if it, it does look like it's low enough, so if this Arcanine does have extreme speed, it'll be able to pick up the knockout. We already saw Salamence not really threatening a whole lot to either of Tyler's Pokemon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be tough for Michael to pull this out. It really depends on what he's got in the back as a way to deal with this Tapu Koko. Yeah, the Tapu Koko not getting knocked out turn one this time around, actually being able to dish out a lot of damage, uh, just trying to uh, rely on that bulky Tapu Koko, maybe some resistances like that berry, uh, and it will be Metagross in the back for Michael. Yeah, it seemed like this game was kind of the opposite. The trade went in Tyler's favor. Uh, Michael traded his Garchomp, essentially, mm -hmm. for the Porygon 2, but it seemed like Tapu Koko was really the bigger threat, where in Game 1, when Michael actually got rid of the Tapu Koko, the rest of his team was really able to put in work and clean up. So it'll be interesting, though. Metagross, one of those Pokemon that can single-handedly carry a game for you. Well, mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see if Metagross can actually do that here, because it does threaten a lot of damage. Arcanine's not going to be able to KO. If it even attacks it, it'll trigger Weakness Policy. But we did see the crucial Will-O-Wisp. That is a yep. great way at dealing with Weakness Policy, Metagross. Absolutely. Uh, Arcanines have not really been running will o -Wisp that much lately. Actually, just going for the extreme speed. Oh. Not going to pick up the KO, though. But it looks like Tyler will go for the Electrium Z, uh, going for the Gigavolt Havoc onto the Metagross on the switch in. We saw through the Protect, it looked like it dealt about 25% last time. So with no Protect coming out from Metagross, this might be enough to pick up the KO. 
Yeah, it'll be close. Clearly, Michael was hoping that Tyra would expect Metagross to protect him. Mm -hmm. Try to get an attack off here, but we'll see if this can even KO. Well, that's a lot of damage. And oh, it is and it to is. Pick up the KO. Metagross goes down. That's Michael Lanzano's uh, biggest offensive pressure uh, until getting that Arcanine off the field. Now has the. Uh, so, and now has the Salamence alone in the back, which we know has the Roselli Berry at least, but no real good options for dealing with this Tapu Koko. Yeah, it's going to be really tough here for Michael to pull this out. Even though Salamence is very healthy and it has the Roselli Berry to reduce Dazzling Gleam's damage, Salamence just isn't capable of dealing enough damage to this full HP Tapu mm -hmm. Koko to knock it out. Salamence usually used as more of a supportive Pokemon, not something, you know, really offensive. It can't go for any Dragon moves against Tapu Koko mm -hmm. because of its typing. Can't go for, uh, I mean, very rarely do you see like an Earthquake on Salamence. There's not really much of a way for Salamence to deal with this Tapu Koko. Absolutely. Salamence is no Garchomp. Uh, Garchomp already went down a little bit earlier, so Salamence is going to have to try and pretend to be Garchomp as best it can, but Tapu Koko on Tyler's side. That offensive Tapu Koko has been just running through this team. Porygon 2 went down early, but Tyler had already made the adjustment, brought the Arcanine instead, was not really going too hard into the Trick Room mode this time around. Exactly. He wasn't relying. He didn't bring both Mudsdale and Muck. Wasn't relying on the Trick Room. Actually just goes for the Volt Switch there, trying not to activate the Roselli Berry, I guess. Uh, we'll actually send out the Mudsdale. So now Michael knows what the final Pokemon Tyler brought this game. It was that Mudsdale. I wonder if there's any any mind games Tyler might be trying to play, saying, oh, I showed you Mudsdale, I'm going to bring it again, and then not. Yeah, it is interesting because he did show that he brought Mudsdale. Uh, so now Michael does know the full team of four that Tyler did bring mm -hmm. to win this matchup. Could have just fired off those Dazzling Gleams and bursted through the Roselli Berry. Yeah, but if I'm Michael, uh, I'm looking towards game three right now. I'm thinking Garchomp is the key in this matchup. There's three Pokemon weak to Garchomp in the mm -hmm. Muck, the Tapu Koko, the Arcanine. We saw just how little damage Dazzling Gleam does to Garchomp. So other than Ninetales and Porygon 2's potential Ice Beam, it's going to be really tough to deal with this Garchomp. I think I want to conserve Garchomp a little bit better mm -hmm. if I'm Michael heading into game three. Absolutely. Going into game three, now both Tyler and Michael have won a match. Uh, of course, this match isn't quite over yet, but uh, just uh, all that's left is for Michael's final Pokemon to faint here. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to watch how both these players bounce back. Tyler already showing that he has the resilience to bounce back after that game one. Michael now going to need to figure out a way to beat this new version of Tyler's team that doesn't go so hard onto the trick room if he's going to hope to make it into the top cut here. Tyler going to want to carry this momentum all the way through into his potential top cut berth as well. Yeah, Mudsdale also has a really good matchup against Michael's team. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be really interesting for Michael to come up with a way to not only preserve his own Garchomp, but deal heavy with slam. this Mudsdale. Right, Mudsdale also showing Heavy Slam onto that Salamence. Will be enough to pick up the KO with the burn. Hands are shook. And it's going to be game three in our final round of Swiss. Swiss round 14. Winner of this match, this one game coming up, is going to make it into our top cut. Yeah, it's also tough for Michael to take out the Porygon 2 as well, just because of how bulky it is. Michael doesn't have any super effective hits on it. Uh, it it'll be interesting to see if he has Toxic on any Pokemon as a mm -hmm. way to kind of stall it out, uh, because using Garchomp to trade for Porygon 2 clearly didn't really work out for Michael. Unless yeah. he adjusts the Pokemon he brings, maybe leave Salamence in the back for something new that does a little bit better against Tapu Koko but it'll be really tough. I mean, the trade for Porygon 2 might have been worth it if Tyler had brought the same Pokemon he had before, if he had been so heavily invested into that Trick Room mode. But unfortunately uh, for Michael, Tyler made that adjustment and wasn't relying so much on the Trick Room and also you know, didn't bring even more Garchomp weak Pokemon. Exactly. Uh, that's a great point because Porygon 2 uh, in game one, Trick Room was so essential for Tyler. He had to get it set up for the Muck, for the Mudsdale, because he brought both of them. Here, Mudsdale was only more of a supportive role. Mm -hmm. uh, he only brought it in at the very end. He didn't really need it. Exactly. It's more of a pivot, able to switch in on some attacks, get a stamina boost to help out against Metagross if it needs to. It's able to switch in against Tapu Koko very easily. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Arcanine, also very effective against Metagross, has the Intimidate for Garchomp should it need it. And it even showed will o -Wisp, so that's a great way of dealing with this weakness policy Metagross. Yeah. So I really like the adjustment Tyler made in Game 2. It's up to Michael now. 
what's he going to do to counter those four? Because I think if I'm Tyler, I might even bring the same four again. It just mm -hmm. looks so effective, and it, he was never really pressured into any difficult situations. So even if Michael does adjust, if I'm Tyler, I think, okay, I'm, it's just going to come down to my skill. I'm just going to have to outplay Michael in this game three. I think I'm going to stick with the four that just proved that they can handle Michael's team. Definitely. That, that very supportive Arcanine, I think, was really interesting because, you know, uh, Arcanine is still technically weak to Garchomp with the uh, ground type attacks, but by using the Intimidate and also having that Willow Wisp is a huge deal for threatening some of these powerful physical attackers on Michael's side. I mean, all of the actual damage on Michael's team is physical damage for the most part. It is. All it's... of his special attackers are more supportive. Exactly. Tapu Koko and Salamence, both very effective Pokemon at dealing with Arcanine, able to switch in in the likes of Salamence, able to dish out a lot of damage in the likes of Tapu Koko. But like you said, these are much more supportive special attackers. All right, well, it looks like it's going to be the Porygon 2 and the Tapu Koko lead again for Tyler and the Garchomp Tapu Koko lead again for Michael. So Michael saw what happened in game two and decided, I want to try that first hit, that first, uh, that first turn again. Yeah, it'll be really interesting because this is another mind game. Does Michael go for the same thing? I mean, Garchomp, we saw how well it can take a Dazzling Gleam, Ice Beam, shouldn't be able to pick up the one-hit KO onto Garchomp mm -hmm. based off of all the damage we saw done to Garchomp previously. Does Michael decide to switch out Garchomp? Does he risk setting up or does he protect here and preserve Garchomp, like I said, I thought would be essential in this match? Yeah, Michael does just go ahead and protect his Garchomp this turn. Uh, Dazzling Gleam will not deal damage to the Garchomp because that deals just a little bit of damage onto Michael's Tapu Koko, which also reveals the Nature's Madness that's deal big. 50% to Porygon 2, which sets up Trick Room. So that's interesting because now Porygon will be able to outspeed Garchomp, but the Garchomp will be able to outspeed Tapu Koko should mm -hmm. Michael decide to stay in, or maybe he decides to pivot here to his slower Pokemon. He's likely got Metagross in the back, maybe he even made an adjustment and decided to bring Gigalith alongside it. That could really take advantage of Trick Room, but Porygon 2 just lost a whole bunch of HP there thanks to the Nature's Madness from the more supportive Assault Vest Tapu Koko. If Porygon 2 went for an Ice Beam there, that would have been a fantastic turn for mm -hmm. Michael, but luckily Tyler made the right move went for the Trick Room there. We'll see, though, depending on what is in the back for each player, how this Trick Room really affects the match. Absolutely. Tyler going for the Trick Room that first turn. Uh, most likely an adjustment from the second game, but of course, uh, we actually didn't get to see Porygon 2 do anything that last game. So a lot of information. Only Tyler knows what he intended. Michael will continue to protect his Garchomp, switching in his own Porygon 2 here. Uh, so again, just trying to pivot during this Trick Room. Mudsdale is the choice for Tyler. Oh, this could be dangerous if a Nature's Madness goes towards that slot. Porygon 2 has to spend this turn recovering because of the Nature's Madness from Tapu Koko. Tapu Koko now the slowest thing on the field does go for a Nature's Madness. And it is going to target down the Mudsdale, so Mudsdale takes 50% of its health on the switch in. Activates the stamina, but we, are, we know that that Porygon 2 on Michael's side has a two-hit KO option on that Mudsdale now. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if Michael has the likes of Salamence in the back and switch Tapu Koko into it, but it also th it's also got to be worried about a combination of Porygon going for an Ice Beam into that slot and Mudsdale going for a High Horse Power in that mm -hmm. slot because there's absolutely nothing Michael can switch into that combination of attack. Absolutely. Yeah, actually, literally nothing on his team. Yeah, everything is either <laughs> weak to Ice or weak to the High Horse Power. It's going to be really difficult for Michael to really pivot out of this. But if he can at least trade something, maybe he deems Tapu Koko as the least needed Pokemon at this point, decides mm -hmm. to trade it, go for an Ice Beam into Mudsdale. Maybe he considers that, uh, you know, an okay trade. Yep. Well, it looks like Michael does not think that Tapu Koko is the most uh, useless Pokemon for this moment. Switches in Salamence instead, at least gets an Intimidate off onto that Mudsdale, making it a little bit less effective. Uh, so Mudsdale actually just goes for a Protect this turn, so no high horsepowers uh, from Mudsdale, just trying to protect itself from an Ice Beam from Michael's Porygon 2, which is what we see. Tyler does go for the Toxic onto Porygon 2, so Tyler, thinking that he has in the matchup against the, Pori the opposing Porygon 2, isn't going to take miss the opportunity to poison Porygon 2, and Salamence does get a switch in here. Yeah, Salamence does get to come in for free, which is nice, and Intimidate Mudsdale as well as Threaten. It does have to watch out for the Ice Beam, but that mm -hmm. Toxic is big. It looks like like in the mirror match here, Michael doesn't have Toxic on his Porygon, Tyler does. That allows Tyler's Porygon to be much more effective. It's so tough taking out a Porygon too, but when you have Toxic, it makes it so much easier. We saw just how much 
Michael had to go to in that last game to even KO Porygon too. Mm -hmm. And it's just so difficult. You have to spend so much trying to KO it, but the likes of Toxic just makes it so much easier if you're able to drag this game out. Yep, that is going to be Tyler's goal here. He's actually going to withdraw his Mudsdale for Arcanine instead. So Arcanine is back out on the field. Tyler is using the same four Pokemon as he did in game two. Uh, so the Intimidate onto both the Porygon 2 and the Salamence is useless. And Michael will actually be able to retreat his, uh, his Salamence for Tapu Koko. So Tapu Koko now back out on the field, no longer threatened by a Mudsdale. Michael just going for the Ice Beam on what used to be Mudsdale, picking up just a little bit of damage onto Arcanine. And Porygon 2 just trying to spread some of that status, now hit both of Michael's bulky support Pokemon with that Toxic. Yeah, and Tyler's got a really good core to just switch around, utilize Intimidate, utilize Stamina, utilize the Resistances. Porygon 2's got Recover and Toxic. It can just stall this game out. Now, Tyler maybe isn't making great use of Trick Room, but it put him in a position where after turn one, when Porygon 2 lost half its HP, it was in KO range from a Tectonic Rage, but mm -hmm. thanks to the Trick Room, it was able to recover. That yep. just by itself is enough to make Trick Room worthwhile in this match. So looking back, that turn one was huge for Tyler, preventing Porygon 2 from getting knocked out so easily, like it did last game, which Michael was trying to go for. He tried to conserve Garchomp while still knocking out the Porygon 2. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for him, wasn't able to achieve that thanks to the Clutch Trick Room. Yeah, Tyler playing that first turn very well to get this Trick Room up on the field. About to expire, but has been making reasonable use of the Trick Room. Porygon 2 from Michael's side does move first with a Thunderbolt onto Tyler's Porygon 2, a critical hit, dealing a good amount of damage. And the Ice Beam from Tyler into the opposing Porygon 2 deals a little bit of damage as well. And it looks like Tyler is going to try and focus down uh, this Tapu Koko with the Flare Blitz. Deals a good amount of damage, but not a KO there. Koko just going to continue to use that Nature's Madness to soften up this Porygon 2. Actually getting it down reasonably low here potentially in range for uh, Garchomp if it can come in at the end of Trick Room. Exactly. It's looking like Michael views his win condition as that Garchomp. Seeing mm -hmm. Arcanine, seeing Porygon, trying to get it low. Mudsdale's already low. The Tapu Koko's weak to it, so it looks like Michael really views the Garchomp as the win condition for this match. He's putting all his eggs into that Garchomp basket. Mm -hmm. We'll see if it pays off. Trick Room expires, so Tapu Koko is now faster, but Electric Terrain ended. Arcanine has extreme speed. Porygon 2 on towers and likely to just recover here. Michael will be able to get Garchomp in the next turn for free, but if Porygon 2 is at too much HP, it may be really tough trying to take it out. Going to be a really close call for either of these players. Michael on the back foot, both of his Pokemon poisoned, just trying to find a way to get back in this game. Needs Tyler to let him. Yeah, he just has to get Porygon 2 low enough so that he can knock it out with the Garchomp, and then Garchomp can single-handedly clean up the low HP Arc or the low HP Mudsdale, the Arcanine, and the Tapu Koko. All right, well, it is going to be the extreme speed. Actually, Porygon 2 goes for Trick Room, and Michael but Porygon 2 here. slower <laughs> its own what Trick Room. What a play! Tyler trying to go for the Trick Room. Michael just saying nope. That the double Trick Room play! That is gigantic because Porygon 2 did not go for a recover that turn. It yep. is now in KO range from Garchomp, and Trick Room did not get up, so Garchomp is going to be the fastest on the field. Arcanine cannot deal with this Garchomp. It does have Will-O-Wisp, though. You have to imagine Tyler is going to go for the Will-O-Wisp there, mm -hmm. but Garchomp just in such a great position here. Great play by Michael, reversing the Trick Room, because if Tyler went for a recover there, he would have set up Trick Room for Tyler, mm -hmm. and Tyler would have recovered. So it was a gutsy prediction, but it really paid off for Michael there. Yeah, really good play there from Michael. Uh, I think that was really his only hope of getting back into this game. He had to have Tyler give him that opportunity to reverse the Trick Room before it could get set. And just like in game one, where Tyler went too much into Trick Room, Game three going too much into Trick Room may have allowed Michael to get back in the game. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what Michael goes for because a Tectonic Rage and a Porygon will knock it out, but Arcanine will then be able to will with Garchomp, making it mm -hmm. more difficult for Garchomp to sweep, but it will still be at full HP, so Michael may still be comfortable doing that. An Earthquake from this range shouldn't knock Ooh. out Tyler's Porygon, but we'll have to see. Well, Salamence is switching in and it is flying, so it does not take damage from a spread Earthquake if that's what Michael has gone for. Ooh, just going for a protect this turn. 
So Tyler does have the opportunity to get another uh, trick room off here. The Will O Wisp, actually, Porygon 2 just goes for recover here. Okay, so it's an interesting play from Michael there. He tried, I guess, hoping that Porygon would go for an Ice Beam into that mm -hmm. slot, but. For Tyler, I mean, there's no reason not to just go for a recover. Right. There. I mean, it, you have to go for recover. If Michael attacks and you hang on barely, if he goes for an earthquake or something, you got to recover that HP back. Right. So interesting protect there, but you can see Michael was trying to get both in at the same time so that Salmons can attack Porygon too. Garchomp can maybe go for an earthquake and just hoping that Porygon goes for an ice beam, but it, yeah. it didn't. And importantly, he, he, it looks like he may just want to keep Garchomp from getting burnt here. Uh, an Earthquake plus something like a Dragon Pulse from that Salamence may be able to take out that Arcanine uh, and keep Garchomp up to survive another Ice Beam from Por one Ice Beam from Porygon 2 if it goes for a Trick Room here. Yeah, the only issue with that, though, is if Tapu Koko comes in, then Dazzling Gleam should be able to finish off Garchomp. Yeah, well, Garchomp is forced to go for this Tectonic Rage here. Uh, a turn after Porygon 2 has been able to recover its health Gonna need a lot of damage on this Porygon 2 to knock it out. Ooh. Oh, it's so not pokey. Enough. That's not enough. No critical hit. Salamence with the Dragon Pulse onto the Porygon 2 as well. Not enough. Arcanine's Will O Wisp will connect, hitting that Garchomp, making Garchomp so much weaker now than it was before. And Porygon 2 able to get the Trick Room off. Yeah, that is big. I think Michael really needed to go for the Tectonic Rage of the turn before the Protect. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he just had to go for the Knockout onto Porygon. If Garchomp gets burned, I mean, it's not totally over because even burned, Garchomp does threaten a lot of damage onto Arcanine and Tapu Koko, and you still have Salmons mm -hmm. in the back for both the Arcanine and the Mudsdale. It could potentially start Swords Dancing to get rid of some of the burn. Yeah, but at this point now with Porygon still around, there's just no way for Michael to take it out. It can just recover and it can just slowly <laughs> win the game for Tyler. So very well played by Tyler there, deciding to go for the recover instead of the Ice Beam into the Protect. That was the right call and Tyler showed why. Yep, Tyler will be most likely taking this game, advancing into top cut. Michael's going to need a lot of rolls to go his way. Porygon 2 just going to recover itself uh, to a green, healthy amount. Arcanine just going to continue to spread that burn. Uh, Will-O-Wisp on to Salamence will slowly deal some damage to that Pokemon. A Dragon Pulse coming out from Salamence will connect uh, onto that Porygon 2 to try and get rid of some of that recover health. And Earthquakes coming out from Garchomp uh, will be able to deal damage to Porygon 2 and the Arcanine, but nowhere near as much as it would if not burnt. Yeah, at this point, Arcanine has done its job. Porygon, it's all up to Tyler's Porygon and should be able to clean this up thanks to Ice Beam, thanks to Recover, thanks to the burn on Garchomp. He's still got Mudsdale in the back. For, in case Arcanine gets knocked out during Trick Room, he can bring mm. that in. And should Trick Room end, he's got the Tapu Koko in the back. It's looking very good for Tyler here. Yep, Tyler can just continue to click Recover uh, and try and uh, stall this one out. Looks like Michael's going to retreat Garchomp, hoping to stall Trick Room just a little bit more. Helping Hand actually coming out from the Arcanine, so there will be an attack here. The Ice Beam from Porygon 2 uh, is going to target down the Porygon 2 on Michael's side. A critical hit as well with three hit points remaining on that Porygon 2. Salamence with another Dragon Pulse into Porygon 2 does not get the return critical hit. Uh, so is unable to knock out that Porygon 2. Michael loses his Porygon 2 and is forced to bring Garchomp back in. Yep, Porygon still has Trick Room up, can still just recover and heal up. Mm -hmm. And two burn Dragons against a Tapu Koko, a Porygon <laughs> 2, a Mudsdale, and even this Arcanine, it's got a little bit of chip damage capability. We saw Helping Hand, it can even extreme speed. Mm -hmm. uh, so Arcanine, even though it's there, not really threatening much damage, it does threaten some nice supportive options as just a way to get increase the damage from the Ice Beam from this Porygon. And yeah. I'm if Michael not can seeing keep, away from Michael, unfortunately. If he can keep putting damage onto this Porygon too as it tries to go for Protects and Trick Room runs out, uh, as it tries to go for Recovers and is able to waited out, he might have a chance, but by protecting there, not going to be able to do so as Porygon 2 is getting basically a free recover there. Arcanine's Flare Blitz into Garchomp's Protect, and another Dragon Pulse coming out from Salamence. Uh, it's going to need a lot of damage to come through here in order to put that Porygon 2 into a KO range, and that's not enough. 
No, unfortunately for Michael, not enough to put that Porygon into K range for some further attacks. Garchomp continuing to lose a little bit of HP. The more it loses, the closer it's going to be to getting into mm -hmm. Ice Beam KO range, getting into Dazzling Gleam, Gleam KO range. Gonna have to go for at least a double protect here. <laughs> yeah, I think you kind of have to. But even then, even if Porygon just recovers. Covers, yeah. Oh, Garchomp goes for the double protect, does not get it. Porygon 2 just goes for the recover, though, so not punished immediately for it. Um, but I believe the punishment will be coming very shortly. Uh, Flare Blitz coming out from Arcanine is going to deal damage to that Garchomp uh, and start getting it into uh, Ice Beam KO range and making that, a, uh, that Dazzling Gleam much more threatening as well. Another Dragon Pulse from Salamence into Porygon 2. Michael's getting a lot of bites at this, but he's not getting any of the meat. Yeah, he's going to need something like a multiple critical hits here. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to have to go for like an Earthquake plus Dragon Pulse and hope Earthquake critical hits the Porygon, hope Dragon Pulse Dragon critical Pulse. hits the Porygon, <laughs> and then hope that even KOs because Porygon <laughs> still so bulky, has a lot of HP, it may not even KO. It. But yep. that's really all he has to go for. Yep, because Tyler was able to get that Porygon 2 recovered up to a good amount of health, when Trick Room was over, Michael doesn't get basically the... Sometimes you can get basically two turns in a row before the Porygon 2 gets a chance to go, but not going to be the case this time. Arcanine just going for that extreme speed. Garchomp gets the Earthquake off. Uh, we'll be able to KO the Arcanine. We'll deal just a little bit of damage to Porygon 2 if he doesn't get a critical hit, which he did not. That is no damage whatsoever to that Porygon 2. So now Michael Lanzano with the Dragon Pulse from Salamence onto Porygon 2. Uh, see if he gets the crit for this one. Oh, looks like he got, <laughs> some, he got some of it, but I don't think even a critical hit from that Earthquake no. would have made a difference here. Ice Beam into the Salamence. That'll pick up the KO. Uh, his hands have been shaken. Uh, Tapu Koko will come back in here. Porygon 2 can always Ice Beam, and that'll be it for Michael Lanzano. And Tyler Miller will advance to our top cut. Yeah, very, very well played by Tyler there. The adjustments he made throughout this match were really impressive. He knew his win condition. After game one, uh, the trade he made, electing not to pick up the KO on Garchomp, really, really hurt him. Mm -hmm. But it looked like he learned from that. He saw how much of a threat this Garchomp is to his team, and he played a little bit differently around that. Prioritized the Garchomp more, prioritized getting burns on it, prioritized getting attacks on it, like multiple Dazzling Gleams, the Ice Beam. Even though Garchomp got set up in Game 2, it just took too much damage to really take control of that match. Absolutely. Both of those players uh, playing very well. Uh, it's always nice to see a, uh, uh, a top cut decider match go to three games. Both those players showing that they deserve to be in the top cut, but only Tyler can advance. And very well played by him. Exactly what you mentioned is that he uh, adapted from that game one really well, just understood where the pain points were on his team, and then realized what Michael needed to do to beat him, and then managed to counter that. Exactly. And you saw Michael try to make a bit of an adjustment in game three, decided mm -hmm. to leave Metagross on the bench. He left both Metagross and Gigalith on the bench. Those are yeah. two big heavy hitters in Trick Room, and we saw Trick Room get set up. Maybe Gigalith or Metagross could have put in some work that match, but against the likes of Mudsdale and Arcanine. Mm -hmm. That makes it a little tough for Metagross, but Gigalith maybe could have done a pretty decent job, depending on its set and how it was trained. Yep. Uh, especially if you have answers to Mudsdale, like the Porygon 2's Ice Beam, like that even Nature's Madness from Tapu Koko, like mm -hmm. the Salamence and Intimidate support. Maybe Gigalith would have been an, an interesting adaptation for Michael to make, but he didn't, so <laughs> Tyler able to advance Could into the top shoulda. cut. Yep, Tyler played fantastically. He recognized how exactly he needed to win after losing game one, and he played to his win condition perfectly. Absolutely. And I really enjoyed watching that Arcanine do work. I think that really supportive Arcanine with the Intimidate and the Will-O-Wisp put a lot of extra pressure onto Michael that I don't think he was expecting from that Arcanine. Yeah, because Will-O-Wisp proved to be such an effective answer against that Garchomp when Michael had him mm -hmm. in kind of a pin in Game 3 where he reversed Trick Room and got Garchomp out against the low HP Porygon 2 yeah. and the Arcanine. The threat of Will-O-Wisp there is what put Michael into a tough spot. It made him go for the Protect where 
even if he didn't go for the Protect, it was going to get burned as long as Will-O-Wisp hit. Yeah. But I think that was maybe Michael's only out. He had to just go for the Tectonic Rage there on Porygon rather than the Protect. Maybe hope Will-O-Wisp misses, and even if it hits, maybe try and win the game still because he might have been able to. That's just how powerful that Garchomp is. Yeah, he did still have enough damage to potentially get a two-hit KO on the Arcanine even through the burn, but... You know, Tyler really pulling that one out, really clutching that one out by the end of it. Uh, really solid uh, turnaround from that game one. Really impressive play by him. Uh, and I'm always excited to see some of these uh, harder Trick Room teams. You know, hard Trick Rooms tends to fall off as the season goes on. Um, but then when you, uh, these Pokemon like Muck and Mudsdale are so good. They've been sort of overshadowed by Snorlax because Snorlax just fits in on any random team. Yep. Uh, but Mudsdale and Muck are really great for a Trick Room team. Yeah, they are. And I really like that Tyler, again, goes for the more hybrid style. He has some faster Pokemon mm -hmm. to take advantage of. Uh, the lack of Trick Room in the likes of Tapu Koko and Ninetales. So I really like that aspect of Tyler's team, but I also, I love Mudsdale personally, <laughs> but I, I personally also really like Trick Room teams, and it seems like a really, really well-made team by Tyler. Absolutely. Well, let's hear about Tyler's team and Tyler, the man himself. He is down on the floor with Anna. Take it away. Thanks, guys. I am backstage here with Tyler, who seems to be pretty happy after that last match. How are you feeling? Uh, it's, it feels pretty great. I, I've just been uh, really kind of nervous the whole way through because I, I lost round one coming in today. So I'm thinking, okay, I've just got to keep playing my game, got to win out, and just, just don't think about record. You got to think about playing Pokemon. A little birdie told me that it has been your birthday very recently. Is, this, is that right? It's true. Yesterday, it was my 24th birthday. Congratulations on a great birthday present. Now, being what, what is your record, and, and what do you need to reach your goals here? I'm 11 and 3, and I just needed to hit top 32 in order to reach Worlds, so it's it's all up for here. That's amazing. Happy birthday. Congratulations. Now let's let's take a look back at this match, now that you've had a second to compose yourself. Tell us about some of the defining moments of getting you to that win. So um, basically, I my goal for all three games was to set, set up Trick Room. In, in Game 1, um, I was able to do that pretty cleanly. Game 2 was a little surprising when he knocked out my Porygon with uh, Sky Drop and Tectonic Rage. And when they let me get up for three in game three, I thought, okay, this puts me in a very good position. I just have to make a couple of right calls, get him to a tough spot with Will-O-Wisp, like what we saw, and then I can just stall him out from there. What would you say was the toughest call that you had to make that you were able to make right? Um, I think it definitely had to be the, the turn where I Will-O-Wisp his Garchomp, because I was thinking if, if he critical hits my Porygon 2 there, then it's, it's all over, and that's, that's never fun. No, definitely not. There, it's been kind of a momentum behind you this year. I've heard even words from our casters like breakout season for you. Do you feel like there's a lot of momentum behind you and like you might be able to finish high in the championships overall? Definitely. I feel a lot of momentum coming into the season. I've had some okay seasons before I've been playing since 2014, but I, I feel like I'm really in my element this year. It's hard to define what gives a person momentum, but if you had to say, what is it that's keeping you on that, that forward movement? It's just staying positive and keeping my mind calm in between rounds. Like I'll, I'll go out, I'll, I'll draw some, some pictures, listen to some music, keep my mind, mind off of Pokemon, and it just helps me keep my head focused. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Congratulations again, and we look forward to watching you as you move forward in the rest of the tournament. Thank you very much. Now it's time to head back to our casters. Thanks, Anna, and happy birthday, Tyler. That's uh, not a bad thing to get, your world's invite the day after your birthday. Yeah, not <laughs> a bad birthday present at all. I don't yeah. think Tyler would ask for anything better. Yeah, well, maybe a championship? Maybe a championship, yep. And Only he's, a few more rounds to go for and, that. And he's got the momentum to <laughs> hopefully reach that goal. Yeah, get, build that snowball all the way down the hill. Yeah, he keeps winning, keeps staying positive. I mean, why wouldn't you be positive if you keep putting on shows <laughs> like he just did? Because that was some great play as we saw last match. And mm -hmm. really looking forward to see how he does in the top cut. Definitely. And especially having come off, uh, coming after losing his first match today, being able to turn that around and then win out the rest of the tournament is a really big deal. And is, uh, something that you, you really get from some of the veteran players, some of the players who've been at this for a while. Being able to, like he mentioned, take that break, go focus on something else for a while, don't dwell on your past, and then be ready for the next game. Because no matter what happened in the last game, 
uh, that game's over. You yeah, exactly. About it anymore. You can't dwell on past potential mistakes or past bad breaks that you got. You just have to move on. I mean, it is important to kind of think, you know, maybe I did this wrong. Maybe I should do this better future and, uh, you know, further in the tournament. But you mm -hmm. can't dwell on that. The match is over. You're not going to change the outcome of that. You just got to reset, refocus. And Tyler proved that that's exactly what he did after losing that first round, was able to put on a great performance each round since. Absolutely. Well, happy birthday to Tyler. Congratulations for making it to Top Cut. Uh, we are wrapping up our final round of Swiss here today, so uh, we will be finding out who is going to be in our Top Cut very shortly. Uh, while we go ahead and tabulate those results, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we will have Top Cut action from the Indianapolis, Indiana North American International Championships. So stay tuned. <laughs> 